Welcome to my Rayman 3 Fan Remake Devlog series. I invite you to join me as I talk about my journey of learning Unreal Engine and programming. I will go over how I made this blank scene turn into this. Come on, I'm kidding. Hey, I like that outfit on you. When does it come off? I'll be showing the models I've made, C++ code, and blueprint code. All right, let's dive in. Hi, welcome to the final episode of what I like to call season one of my devlog series. Today, I wanna to take a closer look at the cast of characters I've created so far for the project, as well as the in-game cutscenes. Why don't we start off with taking a closer look at the cast of characters. First up, we got Rayman. As you can tell, I didn't really change anything here. It's just that to me, the Rayman 3 design is pretty much perfect. So I wanted to leave him pretty much unchanged. Then we have our dear Glowbox, one of my favorite characters in the series. As you can see, I left the proportions completely unchanged again. I just really love the character design in Rayman 3. My god, Murphy's T-pose is slightly nightmare inducing. Fun fact, initially I wanted Murphy's teeth to be a texture that doesn't move when he speaks just like the original, but honestly it just looked lower quality than the rest of the game. It looked like it was unfinished. I actually have an unlisted video where Murphy still has non-moving teeth that I made just to share between my friends. Although the video quality is pretty abysmal. Okay, then there's the hoodmonger rocking a ninja turtle headband. I did give him a slightly longer hat. And then there's his super advanced firearm. and some textures. And this is my friend's slapdash. His weapon of mass destruction. And the textures. I really like how this one came out. For one of the cutscenes, I had to remake the Hoodlum drop shit. It's a little hard to showcase because it's kind of an amalgamation of different old and new assets. But you get the overall idea. Hopefully. The first challenge I encountered when working on the cutscenes was with the rigs themselves. Like I said in a previous episode, I used the original animations for the characters. But the thing is, the rigs on which those animations are don't have proper bone hierarchy. None of them are parented to each other. So if I, for example, rotate the uh, forearm here, as you can see, the hand isn't moving because it's not parented to the forearm bone, bone. And the problem with this is that it's pretty much impossible to make your own custom animations with, with a rig like this one. So I had to come up with a way to make a proper rig and transfer all the original animations to that proper rig so that both the original animations and my custom animations can be used on the characters in game. So the way I did this was first duplicating all the bones in the rig without moving them. Then I transferred all the characters weight paints to the duplicated bones. So for example, now the weight painting that was attached to the original hand bone would be attached to the duplicated hand bone. And then I made a proper 
hierarchy out of the duplicated bones. So that would be enough to create my own custom animations and move the character in a more manageable manner. But none of the original animations are on the new bones right now. So to kind of transfer them, what I do is for every of the duplicated bones, I have a copy transforms constraint. What this constraint does is it overrides this bones location to its target location. And the target I set for every one of these duplicated bones is the corresponding original bone that was that this bone was duplicated from. So now as long as these constraints are active, the duplicated bones are moving the same way the original bones are moving, which makes it so that when I export all these animations to Unreal Engine, these animations are going to be set on the proper rig and not the original rig. And if I want to make my own custom animations, I just have to disable all of these constraints and just go ahead and start animating. Side note, none of the original bones get imported into Unreal Engine because all of the original bones have the deform disabled. And then when I export the FBX file on the armature settings, I have only deform bones set to true. Now the next thing to tackle before actually animating the characters was giving them the option to MO and talk because the original rigs don't give you much fidelity in regards to facial animations. In CG, there are two main approaches for this, at least two that I know of. One is creating a bone-driven facial rig, so just adding in more bones to the rig and animating the characters the same way kind of how you animate the rest of the body. And the second solution is by creating a set of expressions and animating the character by blending between different expressions. I wouldn't say that one approach is better than the other, it's more just of a case of personal preference. I myself prefer creating the facial expressions and blending between them. However, this also depends heavily on the character that you're making, even though I prefer making expressions. For Glowbox, I created a bone-driven facial rig because it just made much more sense for this character, in my opinion. Now, why don't we take a look at how I go about creating those expressions for the characters. Let's take Murphy, for example. So I imported the uh, mesh into ZBrush. This is not the original sculpt. This is the retopologized model that's used in game. And now ZBrush has this layer system where I can record changes I made to the mesh through these layers. Like for example, if I make a new layer now and do some kind of change like that. I can now blend between the unchanged version and my change. What's cool about this is that I also can go to the negatives. So using this approach, I created these seven layers. We have the sad version, the worried one, blinking, <laughs> an O letter, W letter. I'm doing something like this. And an M letter. You can kind of see how by blending between a couple different variations of these shapes, I can create some facial animations. I also got one expression for slapdash. Although it's kind of two expressions if I go the other way. <laughs> and then I got two for the hoodmonger. By mixing these two together, I can make him laugh. So I'm getting closer to creating some cutscenes, but I'm still not quite there yet. I still need to get my bearings on the Unreal Engine sequencer because at that point I still had no experience using it. Luckily, in the original game, there's this one cutscene that can be hardly called a cutscene. I don't even need to animate any characters for it because in the original ripped animations I already have an animation for Murphy reading the manual. So this is where I decided to start. Okay, so here's the first cutscene I created. I hope you're ready for this one. This manual just blows my mind. <laughs> it explains the switch's trigger mechanisms. Duh! Police! Who's responsible for this garbage? I know, pretty amazing. Murphy isn't even in the frame here. But that's because this cutscene gets triggered once Murphy overlaps with this box over here. So that's why he's not in the cutscene in the preview, but in game he would be there. So making the proper cutscene play once Murphy 
overlaps with that trigger box is very simple. You just call the play function on the proper cutscene. Then I have this boolean to make sure that the same cutscene doesn't get played twice. But this is again before I knew about the do once node. So nowadays I would delete all of this and just use this node instead. One more thing to mention about the sequencer is that every sequence has its own blueprint where you can, you know, put in some logic. And this is where I do stuff like disabling the input on the player so you can't move while the cutscene is playing or where I set the UI opacity to zero. I'm not sure about this one, but I think that normally disabling and then enabling the input is enough if you're using the default character controller. But since I made my own movement controller, this wasn't enough because disabling the input doesn't zero out his movement velocity, so he would run indefinitely. So I had to make some additional booleans on my Rayman class. I made it so that when this boolean is true, then his movement speed gets zeroed out, or if he's charging his fist, that also gets zeroed out. Now we better sit down for this one. I made the cutscene skippable by pressing the enter key. I know, I also can't contain my tears of joy right now. Okay, so with that out of the way, it was time to make a proper cutscene. I decided to start with the one with, where Rayman regains his hands because it's very short. Um, I will say that I'm not much of an animator, but even for my standards, this one I think is pretty scuffed. Um, the movement for the characters, I think it's really stiff. But, well, I just decided to keep it as it is and try to do a better job next time because making these cutscenes is really time consuming, at least for me. And in my opinion, the next ones are much better than this first one. So my workflow for making these cutscene animations is to import a part of the map from Unreal Engine to Blender and import the original cutscene's audio file into Blender. And then I animate the characters around that audio file. As you can see, I do animate a camera in Blender too. Although this is just for some basic ideas. Later on in Unreal Engine, I redo the camera animations from scratch. The next animation I decided to tackle was the starting animation. This one I am much more happy with. Come on, I'm kidding you. Hey, I like that outfit on you. When does it come off? <laughs> Don't be so touchy. Here, check out what I found. The manual. It's all in here. If you read the story, you'll find your way out. You might find pretty interesting how you can see which expressions he's using to talk by seeing which letters grow. Because the larger the letter is, the more he's using the expression that corresponds to that letter. What a scaredy cat he is. He's probably hiding someplace. It's not going to be easy to get your hands on him. <laughs> and no pun intended. Oh, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that every action wins you points. Let me demonstrate. Keep an eye on the counter. Whenever you score points, the indicator appears and you switch to combo mode. Of course, the characters don't move uh, when they're not on screen. <laughs> Wouldn't make much sense to animate them right now. Scoring stops. Combo mode stops. One last thing. Points can buy you access to hidden levels. So try to score big. At this point, I knew I wanted the cutscenes to transition smoothly into gameplay when they end, just like a lot of modern games do it nowadays. But I somehow couldn't really find a proper tutorial on how to do this. So I had to figure my own way, which is probably completely backwards and inefficient, but <laughs> In case anyone has the same problem, here is how I go about this. So first of all, as I scrub through the cutscene, you can see that the player ends up here where I want him to start. The default behavior for every sequence in Unreal Engine is that when it ends, it reverts all the changes back to its state from before the cutscene. So to make sure that the player actually stays here, where he is right now, when the cutscene ends, well, one approach could be through the blueprint editor just by making an event that overrides his position at the end because these actually get kept after the animation. But there's a lot more simpler way. If I go to the player's transform channel, so, you know, his location, scale, and rotation, if I right click over here, when you go to the properties, there's actually this section called when finished where you can choose whether after the cutscene is finished, I want to restore the state of this actor from before the cutscene, or I want to keep it. By default, it's I think it's set to restore state, but by changing it to the keep state, I make sure that the player will be 
over here once the cutscene ends. So now it's just a matter of blending the camera smoothly from the camera view to the player's view at the end of the cutscene. Now, this sounds simple, and it usually is in Unreal Engine. What you usually do is just use the set view target with blend node to blend the view from one view to another. But the issue here is that this camera cut tracks, which is very useful because it allows you to cut between different cameras. But the problem here is that it overrides the view target. So that set view target with blend node I showed earlier doesn't do anything while the camera cuts track is active. The workaround I found is to mute this and then set the view target manually for every cut I have, which is as tedious as it sounds. Basically, every time I want the camera to cut, I need to add a custom event that switches the view camera. To be honest, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't really know why instead I didn't just use the camera cuts and then blend the view after the cutscene ends. I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but this sounds like a much simpler solution. <laughs> I'll try it next time when I'm working on a cutscene. And if it works, I guess I'll make a follow-up video to this one. So the next cutscene I tackled was the most complex one, as there's the most characters to animate and it's fairly long. But this is also the cutscene that I'm the most happy with. I find that scream really funny. I didn't animate him running through the door because I reused an original animation for that. I figured that was a good way to save some time. I really liked the idea I had with Murphy snatching the camera to start his monologue because I always found it pretty awkward how in the original cutscene there's all this action happening and suddenly for no particular reason we're forced to just look at Murphy spouting some nonsense. And what I think is really cool is that even though I made this cutscene, Every time I play the game, I get fooled anyway into thinking that the cutscene is ending before his monologue. So I usually press the forward key to start running just to get hit with the reality that Murphy is the one in control. And then there's this cutscene over here, the last one I made so far. Nothing much to say here. I think it's fine, nothing special. I didn't even animate a camera for this one because it's so short. Thank you very much for watching. That covers almost everything I had to make to create that gameplay demo as seen in the video. It's hard to believe that I uploaded that video almost half a year ago now already. There were some things that I didn't cover, honestly, because those things just didn't really fit any of the topics that I had for the videos, so I had a hard time finding the right place to cover them. But none of those things are very significant, so I personally don't really see that as a big issue. Like I said in my previous video, at the moment I will be making less YouTube content because I want to focus on the game. If you want to learn more about my plans, you can go watch that video. I go into a little more detail about that. However, if there is anything you would like me to make a video on, I did open up a Discord server and there's a channel for video suggestions. So if I like your suggestion, then I might make a video on it. So thank you very much for watching, especially if you have been following the series from the very beginning. If that is the case, then that's insane. Thank you very much for that. I wish you all a very good day and hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.